right? So that's essentially the idea of like what I'm gonna be doing here. So I always enjoy when I give this type of talk is like provide an overview from the very top and then it's gonna be like narrowing down little by little so nobody gets lost. And if anybody has any questions along the way, do not sh be shy, ask your question, right? Because this way I'm sure that everybody's actually following what I have to say. So if we stop and think, well, differences and differences. First thing, like, why should I care? Right? So why this is important? Why we spend so much time writing this paper? And to motivate this type of question, what we do is like, well, we leverage some ve a very nice paper by Curry, Clavin, and Zurs in 2020 in the American Economic Association's paper in proceedings. What they did it is that they zoom in at the NBR working paper series in economics. Right? They also zoom in in the top five papers, like empirical papers in economics. And they do a, like a machine learning procedure to capture how often several terms have been used throughout the years. Right, so here I have like, this is figure four from their paper. And in this figure, what they did, like they first subset all empirical papers in the NBR working paper series and the top five economic journals. And they search how often difference and differences appear. Regression discontinuity appears, bunch and event study, right? And of course, from the 80s until 2015, 2018, everything is growing. That's not surprising. And that's like the data revolution, the credibility revolution. Now we have access to better computers, more data. So it's natural that everything is growing over time. So all this is well documented. But what is interesting from my perspective, it is the levels, right? So in the last year, like in the last 20 years, if you say, there is a lot of econometric advances in regression discontinuity designs, right? So many papers have been pushing forward this literature. And Around 10% of the NBR working papers around 2018 mentioned regression discontinuity. On the other hand, difference and difference is more than double. So it's 25% of the empirical papers at NBR refer to difference and differences. So why we take the time to write this, this project, right? Because in our view, difference and difference is the bread and butter of empirical research. And as soon as I say that, you should be asking yourself, why? Like, what is so special, right? Because, I mean, if I tell this is popular, why it's popular? Does it make sense to be popular? Or just because it's easy to run? And all that going to contribute? But I want to spend some time, like, just to give a very high lens about my personal perspective about why this is popular, right? And essentially, let's consider a situation that I don't have an experiment. So I'm, I'm, I'm working at Microsoft these days. I'm going to be talking a lot about A-B tests. Like the language, just to think about A-B tests as RCPs in large scales, right? It's exactly the same language. But let's consider the case that I, I don't have the luxury of actually running a randomized one control. So observational data, right? Then what are my options available if I want to highlight some causal effects given the, the setup that I'm interested in? Well, number one tool that people are going to use in daily, like routinely, is like I'm gonna do like a matching exercise, propensity score matching, nearest neighbor matching. And I'm gonna call that look alike, because that's how people in the tech industry have been calling that. And because it's much easier to explain to non-technical people what is a look alike analysis than a nearest neighbor matching. So the, the terms here is really like make things more like close to us. So that's one approach, right? We can also use regression techniques. And if you wanna go fancy, you can do machine learning, like neural nets, deep learning, all those things. So that's one category of tools that we can actually use. Right? So if I don't have access to an experimental data, right? so some try to highlight some causal effects behind this. What is the catch? The catch is that to reliably use these procedures, you have to assume that everything that matters is observable. Right? So everything that, I, that matters for my outcome of interest, right? and everything that matters for the selection to treatment, right? I have to be able to capture in my data set. That's a very strong requirement for the data perspective, because very often, I mean, let's suppose that age matters. I don't have the luxury to always have age in my data sets, right? Or gender, right? Not gender is very often like self-report. People do not report gender. So simple things, I'm not talking about, even about ability, hospital quality, those are very harder. Simple thing that is like pure observables. We don't have sometimes access to those informations. Then it's like, okay, I'm gonna still run these classical tools 
and I'm going to close my eyes and I'm going to hope that everything is kind of good. That, that is fine. It's like, at least get the ball rolling. So that's one option. What is the second option? Second option is like to kind of leverage time as an important dimension of my data set. So I'm going to have everybody going to be treated. Everybody's exposed to the policy. What I'm going to do, I'm going to compare me before the policy and after the policy implementation, right? This is very appealing, especially if I am very close to the date of the implementation of the policy, right? So if I am like, I don't know, like one month, one, you know, one month out, like one, like two months, one year even. But once I start looking for long run effects, which is often of interest, other things happen along the way, right? Because other things happen like me, the economy may be having shocks, COVID may hit us, right? I mean, other policy implementations have been tried. So this is gonna be kind of tricky to kind of like lead to get causal effects only leveraging like before and after, like especially when looking for long run effects. So these are the two classical appealing procedures, right? And the way I like to think my difference and differences is like option one is the father, option two is the mother. They get together, they have a baby, right? And the baby is different in differences. Because the idea of the difference and differences is to combine the best of both parents, right? And I, mean, I have two young daughters, so that's my mental model these days. I mean, my kids have to get the best of me and my wife, right? So here, like, well, difference and difference is supposed to capture like the attractive features of regression techniques, so look-alike models, and also the, the attractive features of before and after. And how is it gonna do that? It's gonna do that by allowing some types of selections on unobservables, right? We're gonna impose some restrictions on this, how these unobservables can affect selection, how these unobservables can affect the outcome, right? Because there is no free lunch, it's not a miracle. And this, is, this assumption is gonna be essentially called a parallel trend assumption. I'm gonna talk about this in a minute more, but I mean, just to have an overview, why the idea is popular? Because I have to, the data requirement is not so high. I have to have observation before and after the policy. I'm gonna have, to have observation about units who have been exposed to the policy and units who have not, right? And essentially that's it. And I'm gonna to have to believe on this type of selections, like restrictions that we're gonna make over here, part of it. Right, so this is essentially the way I think about the popularity because we do have a lot of data I mean, in the US, like different states adopt the policy different points in time and we can leverage all those variations very easily. So, and that's like fine, I get it, all appealing, all makes sense, right? And this has been essentially the motivation for doing difference and differences since I mean, it's early, like the popularity of difference, difference and differences actually started in the early 90s, right? When Card and Kruger, the minimum wage study, like, so since then, people are using it and like pushing it forward. But if you see any stuff, that what happened in the last five years, things went crazy, right? They, number of new tools in difference and difference that have like popped up in the last five years, it is astronomical compared to what happened 15 years before that. And that's kind of daunting because we like the appeal, but there's so many things going on that it's hard to digest and actually reliably use it. So that's the motivation for us to write this paper. It was like, well, let's try to summarize what is going on from our perspective, right? So I mean, people say, oh, this is a scientific paper. Yes, but all of us here are authors of different and different papers. So this is what had happened from our view, right? So other researchers are gonna have different points of view as well. They wanna take different stance, but we're gonna try to provide concrete recommendations for what we believe are the best practices along those ways. And to make things like linear and explain things little by little, my goal here today is to start very simple. We start with a canonical model, two periods, two groups, Right, I'm gonna be kind of brief on that. And I'm gonna start from that just to make sure like once you understand the classical basic model, like the literature have expanded in different directions. Most of the people talk about expansion and difference and differences in terms of staggered adoption or differential treatment timing, but that's only one direction that the literature have expanded. People have talking about sensitivity analysis, like pre-tests, clustering, right? So once you understand the requirements of the basic model, you're gonna see like, well, I can extend here, here, there, right? So I'm gonna like provide an overview on big picture of that. I have 45 minutes and I talk a lot. 
right? I love talking. I can talk about this for the rest of my life, right? So I'm going to have to make some cuts. And most likely, I'm going to stress a lot of my talk about the advances in the stagger adoption setup, right? Because I have, this is like, I can fit this into a, like 30 hours easily, right? I have done actually 30 hours of this course on this topic. So, so to understand the context, right? Let's consider I have like longitudinal data, so panel data, right? I have time periods one and two first, and I have several units. Units are indexed by I, or think about patients, if you may, right? Or families, or firms, or states, or counties, right? And I have T equals to one is before treatment, T equals to two is after treatment, right? In period one, nobody's treated, right? If you have units who are treated in period one, you're gonna drop them, right? So, so you're gonna say like period one, nobody's treated. In period two, some units are exposed to treatment and others remain untreated. So that's the basic case. Right? So if you are always treated, we're not gonna use you, right? So we're gonna drop it from the top. And we're gonna also talk about potential outcomes in DAX by treatment sequences, right? So I'm gonna have me, because nobody's treated in period one, I have always zero in period one. So that's essentially gonna write Y1 as units were exposed to treatment. Potential outcomes for units were exposed to treatment in period two, right? And Y0 units were never exposed to treatment in that window of time. So in this word, like canonical case, like how I'm gonna move forward. Again, you're gonna to have to make assumptions because untreated potential outcomes are never observed for treated individuals. So how are you gonna impute that missing contrafactor? You're gonna to have to take a stand, you're gonna to have to make assumptions. In diff and diff, you're gonna make assumptions like the, the mean. Most common assumption is the so-called parallel trends, and just states that in the absence of treatment, so I have Y zeros everywhere, the, the average evolution of the outcome among treated units, it is the same as the average evolution of the outcome in the absence of treatment among untreated units. Once I have this, I also gonna assume that units do not act on the knowledge that they're gonna be treated later, right? So in period one, right, which is pre-treatment, Y1 and Y0 is the same. So we're gonna make this no anticipation. And just to be, these two assumptions together will allow us to identify the ATT, the average return effect among treated units in period two, right? In period one, doesn't matter. It's zero by assumption, right? Because the no anticipation. But in period two, I'm gonna be able to identify this target parameter, the ATT, and by some manipulations, some algebraic equations, we can write under those two assumptions, this is like how I'm gonna identify the ATT, the change in the outcome among treated units, minus the change in the outcome among untreated units, and that's essentially the birth of the right? This is very beautiful from my perspective, because you can teach this like a high school. This is just, Averages, right? So this is a simple comparison of means. People say, "Ah, oh, I don't use p statistic. I don't use like p test. I don't use simple comparison of means in real life." Well, you can, right? So this is like a very good, very simple and intuitive procedure. In practice, so you can estimate this guy using what I call DID by brute force by hand, just replacing population expectations by simple means. Nobody ever does this, right? We, especially we social scientists, we're somehow addicted to regressions, right? Because since day one in college, like you, you, you learn a lot of statistics in stats 101. First of means, two populations, one population, same variance, different variances, all that mumbo jumbo. Then you go regression. And once you see regression, you never go back to those tools again. So our tendency is to leverage what we have learned for so many years. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna look at this and well, can I do this? Can I fit this procedure into a regression? Because I have learned so much about regressions, right? That I want to leverage all that like previous learning to implement this. And in this canonical case, the answer is yeah, we can do that. It's, it's essentially free. All I have to do is to run a regression of the outcome of interest for unit I in period C against unit fixed effects, time fixed effects, and this treatment dummy here takes value one if I'm treated in period C, zero otherwise. And some error term to capture like unobservables. So this is for balanced panel data. If you have unbalanced panel data or video cross sections, 
you're not going to be able to, to include this fixed effects here, right? Because you have only one observation per unit. So just replace this by a triple dummy in a group dummy, if you may. Everything goes through exactly the same. And why we like this? Well, because now beta here, it is we can show the beta it is equal to the ATT under our assumptions, and we can do inference in the standard way as we have been always doing. So you can, you can construct confidence intervals, p values, and all that nice stuff we usually do, as long as we have many clusters. So here I have like units i, so we can think about i as a cluster of units. As long as I have many treated clusters and many untreated clusters, all this goes through. So what happens in the literature, right? They look at this model here, so yes, that's, I, I move from here to here, right? Very smooth, very nicely, right? And everything we know from regressions applies directly. Now, what happens if I have several time periods? And if I have several time periods, units can be enrolled to treatment in different points in time. And the first question is, can I still do this? Of course you can. The question is, can I do this reliably, right? That's one of the literature one of the branches have been pushing forward in that direction. The second direction is like, well, do I really believe in parallel trends? Because parallel trends, whoever invented that phrase, it is a genius. It is very intuitive and it's very appealing. It's very easy to explain that in the absence of treatment, the average outcome would grow similarly, right? But in practice, yeah, do I really believe that? Like this holds exactly or only an approximation? What happens if I have violations? Could I trash my DID analysis completely, or I can try to save, like, save it doing some sensitivity checks? So a lot of the literature have expanded in this issue as well, right? And lastly, what happened is that if I have, what if I have a single critical cluster, or if I have very few critical clusters, or very few uncritical clusters, how can I do inference? How can I construct confidence intervals? Right? Because the idea here is like with very small number of observations. I cannot apply a central limit theorem. I cannot use law of large numbers. I give you 20 observations and I say, construct a confidence interval. You have to freeze. There's no way you can do that reliably. So this third branch is like, what additional structure I can impose in the data, right? That's gonna allow me to extrapolate information from one group to another. Again, like this is essentially three big branches of like, we have focus in this review. And there's everything is very active over here. And each of this takes me like at least one hour to talk. To. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna focus on the first one for personal reasons, because I have worked on that personally, right? If John Roth gives the same talk, we're gonna talk about the second bullet because he has worked on that. But if Alista gives the same talk, she most likely gonna talk about the second bullet as well because she did pre-testing like and all those issues. I happen to work on the first one. So I'm gonna talk about the first, one, right? So. I have a course online that goes on to these like 30 like, hours of all days machine learning and all that. You can check color solutions online, everything is there. So, and still, even in the first topic, the, there's so much going on that I cannot go in detail about everything. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna be brief about the problems. So Goodman Bacon, it is a sad paper because it's telling you everything you did in the past Right, it's not really reliable, but so it's sad in that sense. On the other hand, it's an eye opener. So, in my view, this is a paper who changed the literature, right? So, he it, it was published in 2021. He has around like 2,500 citations as of now. So, it's kind of like it, 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 it literally changed the literature. I'm going to spend some time over there. I also want to talk about Sun and Abraham, which is also, I mean, this is a kind of like middle ground paper, they have some sad messages and some good messages. The sad message of Sun and Abraham is that if you do advanced study plots, right? We used to look at pre treatment, this treatment leads as a way to assess the validity of our assumptions. Sun and Abraham is telling you, stop doing that, right? Because that is also like the same kind of like bad comparisons you're making in Goodman Bacon, he shows us it's happening on those, even when there is parallel trends everywhere. So this is like some kind of a contamination effect going on from treatment leads to treatment lags. And then I'm gonna talk about a happy paper, right? Which is called Ryan Santana, which is like, we were, we were working on all this together at the same time without much communication, except us and Bacon, right? because Bacon was my neighbor, 
my office neighbor. So we talk a lot about these issues. And the way I see is like, well, Baker, Sam and Abraham us complement each other in the sense that like we know problems, we know how to fix now. And essentially we're gonna start working from first principles. There is a lot of other papers talking about how to solve these issues as well. Right? So I'm gonna talk about Carlo and Santana for obvious reasons, but there is the Shais Mahtan and Otto Fourier at the AER talking about this as well. So Jeff Udrich has a new paper talking about this. Borussia Jorabel and Spies have another paper talking about this. And before I get to that, let me tell you right away that those papers are very similar to each other. How do they differ? They differ depending on the type of assumption, the, the type of parallel print assumptions you're willing to impose, right? How you handle covariates, right? And the type of uncertainty your standard error is supposed to reflect. So this is essentially the big difference between those papers. In practice, they tend to be very similar if you have spiral trends everywhere, in pre-treatment periods and in post-treatment periods, they tend to be very similar. And Borussia actually are very spies and Udrich are gonna be more precise. How they're gonna be more precise? Because they are restricting pre-trends. Carlo and Santana is very bias aware. We do everything to avoid bias, even if that costs precision. Right? So we're not gonna use information from the past because we are afraid of parallel trends being avoided. The price we pay, we can get longer confidence intervals. But that's, we're gonna to get to that in a moment. So with more than two time period, the variation of the timing, this is the warning that I want you guys to remember. So econometric practice and econometrics theory should be going hand by hand, right? This is one case that econometrics practice was so ahead of the theory, right? And nobody was paying attention, right? Because the two period case, two group case, those two things are exactly the same. Uh, nobody is living in that simple case. So this is like a warning. When you, you see these discrepancies, it's a good opportunity for us researchers to tackle these issues. So I'm gonna start talking about Bacon. And the idea is essentially like, well, in the two period case, these two things affect regression work, right? I get this beta in reference to the ATT. And what I think, I think about, well, I'm a clever person, what I'm gonna do, I'm going to consider a much more general model. And instead of having group dummies, I'm going to have unit fixed effects to capture all the idiosyncratic features. Instead of having a single post treatment dummy, I'm going to have a time fixed effects to capture common shards. And here I have this variable like take value one if I'm treated zero. Otherwise, I'm still going to keep it here, this DIT, which takes value one if I'm treated zero otherwise. All right, so this DIT takes value one if you're in post treatment period and zero if you're in pre treatment period. But every unit is potentially exposed to treatment in different points in time. Right? I'm going to be clear here in a minute in an example. And for simplicity, let's assume that once treatment is on, it is never off. And this is not a limitation. It's just as a, as a reminder that us sometimes do not forget what happened with us. Right? So if I, if I give you a treatment today, even if you're not treated tomorrow because you're not in the training room, you don't forget what happens today, unless the treatment is like very temporary. If I give a painkiller today, it doesn't matter tomorrow. But if I give you a hundred painkillers today, it may happen tomorrow. Right? So this is essentially like the idea of treatment never turning off. It is that we're not going to restrict how long it takes for the treatment effect to die. Down. If you're willing to take a stand, you can relax the stand. So. Here is a nice place to talk about this. I'm gonna talk about ACA extension, right? So just think about like, give numbers. We're gonna like motivate this to the fact of like Medicaid expansion on health insurance rate among a population of interest, right? And if I'm gonna do this, because like suppose I'm back in 2014, I'm gonna say like, good, Medicaid expansion, right? I have two groups. I have states who have expanded Medicaid, in 2014, early expansion states. I have non-expansion states as of 2014. So I have two groups only. I plot the health insurance rate for my target population and everything looks very parallel before treatment takes place. Then in 2014, they defer and they say, oh, this is good. This discrepancy here, like this jump in this upper curve compared to the second, it is a fact of the policy. We can do different, this classical here, no like, complication. Well, but this is stopped in 2014. I'm patient. 
I got 2015 new data. In 2015, other states have expanded Medicaid. And so what happens? Well, states who have not yet expanded as of 2014, now split. I have states who still in 2015 have not yet expanded, but I have like slightly later expansion states. All right, so now I have three groups, several time periods. I can keep doing this up to 2019 when we stop getting the data. So as time is passing by, the chances that you're gonna have more groups, it is higher. So the more periods you have, the higher the chance that you're gonna get like multiple groups. And here when I have like one, two, three, four, five groups, and I don't know, 12 years of data. So I have multiple periods, multiple groups. So if this is what I'm gonna do, I have that set up. What, the, what economics practice, health policy practice proceeds? Well, this is easy. I'm gonna run this regression and I'm gonna call beta here, my parameter of interest. And beta gonna summarize the effect of the like, medical expansion on health insurance rates. And Bacon, like myself, many years like, hey, what is beta? What is going on over here? Right? Whenever I ask this question before, people look at me and say, what do you mean? Right? What, beta is the causal effect, but what causal effect? It is an average treatment effect on the treated. It is a, like, it's a weighted average. What are the weights? What are the groups? So if you look at econometrics textbooks, they're going to tell beta hat it is this. This doesn't help me. But this is like just math, just notation. I cannot explain this to my wife, what is beta hat over here. So there is not much intuition of over here. And that's the starting point of the Baker decomposition. But they say, he was back in 2018, when you all start working on this, I think like 70% of Baker's paper were using this technique. So he's doing this for his own sake, to better understand it. So we say, well, to give an intuition of what's going on, let's simplify our life. Let's have only three groups. Early expansions, late expansions, and never expanders, and never his as of 2019 at the end of my paper. So if I give you these three groups and several time periods, you can do many different defendants. The first type of defendant you can do, it is like, let me drop right, the later expanders, and I'm gonna have only early expanders as of 2014, Right, and the never expanders. I have a single the timing. I can average everything happens in the before period. I can average everything in the after period, and I can do before and after treatment and control in this time average sense, a valid classical DI. I can do the same thing, but now dropping the early expanders and do the same type of analysis of like late expanders versus never expanders. Right? I have only one post treatment period. I can average everything that happens before a second type of defending. I can also drop the never expanders right here. And I'm also going to drop the data from 2019 because in 2019, everybody's treated. So I'm going to drop that here because, like, if I do not have a never expander and everybody's eventually treated, in this last year here, there is no comparison group. So I'm going to drop that here, drop the never expanders, right? And I'm going to compare, like, early treated versus later treated. And the later treated is gonna act as a control group for the early treated. I do a different diff here, again, mapping all this back to the two by two case. So all these three comparisons are easy and valid. What happens is that two affix effects regressions also do a third type of comparison. Because two affix effects regression is looking for variation in the BIT. It doesn't care if it's from zero to one or from one to zero. So it's all, all less in general is variation of hunger. It's time to compare all the data that you can to minimize means whatever. So when you run a regression, there is this fourth type of different data that you can run, which is because from 2014 until 2019, this black line here, the early treated, remains treated in the whole window. They don't change treatment status. The green curve changed treatment status from off to on in 2019. So what it's gonna do is like, well, this is not a switcher. The control group, the early treated in this window, it is not a switcher. They stay constant. This one is switcher. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do different diff like using the already treated units and the control group. And that's the beginning of the collapse, the beginning of the problems. Because this curve here may be already like being far away from the, it's not a parallel trend assumption. 
because these units are already treated. So I'm using already treated units as a comparison group for eventually treated, and that's going to induce potential bias because of dynamics. So what Bacon tells us, it is like, well, either you, doesn't matter if you like it or not, whenever you're running these type of regressions, you're computing these four type of different things, right? One for each. And all of us are going to attach weights for each one of these comparisons, to, because all of us are reporting a single parameter, a single beta. So it's going to run these four different types and glue them together to give you an end result. And that's what's the Baker decomposition, right? So each of these coefficients here is going to be one of the types of the like different for the subpopulation. And the weights are also going to matter. What are the weights here? The weights depend on how much sample I kept in that window, because I'm doing subsample, right? I'm dropping data little by little. So how much data that I kept there matters and enters in the quadratic form. But also I have this second component of the weights, which is like in my whole window of time, where treatment happens. If treatment happens in the, in the middle of my sample, I'm gonna give you more weight. If, if treatment happens in the beginning or the end of the sample, I'm gonna give you less weight. And you ask me, why? I have no clue. It is what it is, <laughs> right? So that essentially is, I mean, people call it data decomposition mechanical because it's, this is like what is going on behind the scenes. You don't have to like it, you have to accept it, right? And that's essentially this various weights going on. Yes? So is one advantage of this that you can actually then parse out these pieces and look at it? Because like you showed us various yes. parameters and that might be a bit just to understand each of them. That's exactly the way we built these things. Color S and Tana, it is nothing than do this one by one and pick your weights, right? So if you run OLS, you're letting the method choose the weights for you, right? And it's not ruling out any of these one persons. I'm like, why should we do that? Just do this one by one, right? And pick the weights that you care. If I like this weight better, pick it. So Carlos and Santana is just like, do this one by one, and you're gonna pick the weights. Right? So that's essentially how you're gonna solve the problem. So just like, we don't have to be obsessed with regressions. We can run one regression at a time, but then we group them together the way you want. But that's all methods in this literature, we're gonna do a version of this. So, so that's a data decomposition, right? He's gonna tell you like, when you run this two way fixed effects, right? You're gonna get this weighted average. What is my beef with this? I do not like these weights personally. I can't interpret them. I don't understand why if I, if I, if I am generous, I give you more data from before, suddenly your weight's changing because if I give you more data from before or my more data from after, the relative position of the treatment changes, so I'm changing the weights. If you do robustness checks, what if I drop some data from before? What if I drop some data from the after? You're changing the weights. So your robustness checks in the techniques, you plot different ones, these all change the weights. What is the advantage of this? That if you have treatment effect homogeneity, so things do not change across different groups, these weights are awesome. It minimizes like, like mean square error. So under, if you do not have autocorrelation, if you have homoscelasticity, you can't beat this, right? Me, I don't believe in homogeneity, but I, I'm a very extreme person in that sense. So that is a middle ground over there. People tell me I don't actually do that. It doesn't sound extreme though, because if you really care, like you said, about having relevance for policy, you would want to understand policy limitation. And then, like you said, choose your weight yes. according to, you know, so maybe it implements slowly and there isn't much happening and then you can pick that up. Yes, I agree. I think that's the way for like, in my view, the questions always come before the methods, right? And here is like things get reversed. So I want to, I want to run to a fixed effect because I have no regression. And then the question gets messed up with the methods. So if you split these two, all this goes so Bacon does this in this application, right? That is a never treated group. So again, this weight's gonna mess things up in two situations. If I have treatment effect dynamics, right? And if, I, if my never treated group, it is relatively small compared to the rest of the groups. In this Medicaid expansion example, my never treated group is much larger than the other ones. And there is not much dynamics happening. So those weights, not gonna really change anything. 
right? And I have like here plots I have later on, right? So in this case, I mean, because that is the, you can compare these things here. Later, I mean, you can di choose different methods. The point estimate is going to be very simple, right? So if you drop in this application the never expanders, then you do see negative rates. Oh, yeah. So this is, and I can go back. So these rates here, again, they're always positive, right? So people say, oh, I'm, I'm going to bake out the composition and I'm getting all positive weights. They have to be positive. These are regression weights. All the weights enter into squares and variances. So how you get from positive weights to negative weight story? You get there because once you attach a causal interpretation for this, what are you going to do here? This last type of diff and diff, it is getting things in reverse. Right, because I'm using already treated, and I haven't like eventually treated here. So if you want to do this like in a different different word, this is going to be treated. This is going to be the control. So if I put a minus in front of that, that's my negative weight. Right, but the weights that is always displayed in the back of the composition, it is always positive, and it's funny. I do a lot of referees, right, and I often get oh I did a back of the composition and now my weights are positive. I'm like have you read the paper? <laughs> because they have to be positive, they can't be negative. Now, if you want to move, now if, if you look at this weights here, the S, the layer versus already treated as a control group, the bigger these weights, the more likely you are to be in a situation that this non convex weights are going to come into play. But that's one idea, right? And I don't essentially, my, I don't believe two way fixed effects is very policy relevant in a situation where you have triple effect heterogeneity. Right, and this, and this discussion traces all the way back to Gene Hackman's work, like in the IV and micro treatment effects, just different ways. What comes first, policy question or methods? Right, so there is this late versus empty, better late than nothing. Same thing here is applied. And here, the key is like dynamics and heterogeneity. I knew I'm going to be out of time, so I'm going to just be what happens? So you look at me and say, like, Pedro, this is. Fine, dynamics is a problem. I can take care of dynamics. I'm just going to include a bunch of treatment leads and a bunch of treatment legs, right? So if, if there is dynamics, treatment leads and treatment legs are going to capture a lot of that. So I'm going to say, yeah, let's let's take a look, right? So Sun and Abraham, the starting point of Sun and Abraham is like, yeah, I, we all agree that this type of regression technique, when I replace the single beta with a bunch of different betas from treatment leads and treatment legs, when I say treatment leads and treatment legs, I mean like I'm gonna have indicator variables that ask you how long have you been treated? I have been, this is my first time being treated. So K is equals to zero. If you're in that period, takes value one. What happens if I am one period ahead since treatment started? K is equals to one. This variable here, VIT one, will take value one. So I'm gonna essentially like not discretize, I'm gonna like expand this treatment dummy into a bunch of like questions. I'm going to interrogate the data, unit I, imputed C, and ask him, is this your first time you're, you're treated? If yes, take value one, no, take value zero. And that I did. So in general, gamma K legs are supposed to capture dynamics, right, in the future. And gamma K leads here is going to do the idea within the past. It's supposed to capture potential violations of your identifying assumptions. No anticipation in violation of power trends. And does this work? Right? This is essentially the event study coefficient plot from the application. When I say, does it work? I mean, what is going on behind the scenes in these coefficients? What kind of comparison am I making it? Does this always work? And this, which circumstances does this work or not? Can I trust this output? And that's essentially the question that I want to ask. And that's what San Abraham comes into play, right? They say, well, Let's see what this is work. And the message oops. See, I'm going backward. So what I'm gonna do here it is that essentially summarize this in like one slide. The message is somehow negative, 
because there are some potential contamination effects from the future to the past, right? So I'm gonna you know so the message of Sarah and Abraham is like well, if you have if you are in a world of that is triple effect heterogeneity, right? This specification over here can be tricky. I cannot interpret gamma lags and gamma leads as measures of how long have you been treated, the fact of like of dynamics. And I'm gonna illustrate this in a very simple simulation, right? You may have seen this plot throughout the internet. I have made this plot 20 times. <laughs> this is a situation that like everybody is eventually treated, right? But I have heterogeneous dynamics. So the last cohort and the first cohort benefits more from treatment. There is no violation of any assumption. In fact, I allocate units to these groups completely random. And so I have like, and if you don't believe me, I have the BGP here and I have codes on my web page. You can just try it. And if you do that analysis, I run this regression and I cap the leads and the lags here. I mean, I'm gonna say, I suppose I only care about a window that is from minus five until five. That's just like nearby this event. I'm gonna beam the endpoints because I don't wanna have a super long regression. I'm gonna beam the endpoints. So if you're more than five periods ahead, unless I'm gonna beam these guys and I'm not gonna report them. You do this, I do the simulation 1,000 times, this is what happens, right? So the red curve here is like what you're hoping to get like this average. And the blue curve is the average over these 1,000 simulations. What is shocking to me here it is, I mean, means I can leave it some direction. But if I plot, if I give you this plot and you're as an empirical researcher, you see this violation of pre trends here, there is no way on earth you're gonna continue. You're gonna start twisting. Let me add individual specific trends. Let me choose a different method. Let me do matching, let me do other stuff. And at the end of the day, that's, there is nothing wrong with the design. It's just that the tool that you're using it has some like spillover effects. So contamination from future to past. Uh, and that's the mechanics of all of us. The message is like in matrix inversion is a beast. It's very hard to get intuition of matrix inversion, right? It's not a diagonal matrix. I have all of the diagonal elements and that's what's going on from the future to the past. And you say, well, fine. What happens if I do not be? I include all leads and legs, right? And you're gonna get something that's here, right? So again, these simulations are extreme. They are made, they are built to shock, right? So I have extreme heterogeneity, right? Everything is growing over time. And I have, and I'm not dropping data from the always treated group, these periods. If I drop data from 2004 onwards, this bias gets smaller. They're still there, but it gets smaller. So these simulations here, these pictures are built to shock. They are not realistic, right? But I, if I give you a very small deviation from the red and the blue, nobody listens to me. So I have to shock first and then move forward. And the solution, like the way we move forward, is like is what Calloway sometimes is doing it. It is like, let's not rely on regressions, but it is like from foundations that each group that you want to compare with each other, build this one by one and choose the way you're going to aggregate them together. The way you choose to aggregate in general. It is building on population weights. So if a cohort is big, I'm going to give them more weights. If the cohort is small, I'm going to give them more weights, right? Because then I mean, I'm going to vary precision. And by using this kind of population of sample size weights, right? I can get, I can avoid making these forbidden comparisons, right? And that's essentially color answer, right? So here I have like a lot of essentially details on color answer, but that's the this, this slide I want to stop. It's like, what's the takeaway message? We can and we should separate this problem into smaller pieces, right? Let's first talk about identification. What are my assumptions, right? What I care, what are the parameters of interest? What are the policies that I'm trying to like analyze? Let's establish ground rules. You're gonna say, well, there are too many parameters. Like this. Here I'm gonna have one ATT for each time period, and for each cohort, if I give you 10 groups and 10 time periods, you're gonna have, I don't know, like 100 of those. Too many. So that's not a problem. Let's group them together. Think about the Lego. Every single piece is a Lego piece. You can build whatever you want with these Lego pieces. 
That's not a stack, that's aggregation stack. Once we talk about aggregation and identification, let's choose our estimation method that respect our assumptions, right? So we can do the estimation and inference steps that are built to respect our assumptions from the very beginning, right? And you can do this like concretely, line by line. And once you do, if you follow these steps for any econometrics problems, all the issues are gonna go away. The question is, do I get precision? Like, or can I actually, um, are my confidence intervals too wide? And that's where you have to start thinking about changing your strategy, adding more structure, right? I cannot, we cannot make miracles. If I give you 20 observations, it's very hard to get precise things, unless you believe things do not change across these groups. So in Kaloyan Santana, I mean, the building blocks are gonna be this group end time parameters. So it's one ATT for each cohort and cohort are defined by the time you turn treatment on. For each time period you are imposed. We can identify these guys using different parallel trend assumption. So the two leading cases is using the never, the unit who have never exposed to treatment as a comparison group. This can be extreme because if they are never exposed to treatment, then they may be very different from the others. If you don't want to use them, you drop them from the data and you use all units who have not yet been exposed to treatment as up to them. Right? You can do this thing. These assumptions tend to be stronger. People said parallel trend is not testable. That's not true. This one here is very testable. There is a lot of over identification restrictions being over input over here. You can actually test it. So in the paper, we discuss a little bit about this. And once you do this, identifying ATPGTs, as Caroline was mentioning, is essentially going one by one, one of these groups, one at a time, do this separately, identify them all, and then it's a matter of how to group them together. And as I mentioned, pick your Lego pieces, right? You can pick each Lego piece. And if I like houses, but you like cars, you can build a car, just but the pieces are the same. We can build a piece, I cannot build another one. But we have to be transparent and direct about these Lego pieces. In the paper, we talk about different weights. By far the most popular one are the event study ones that I have over here, that I have over here. Then I'm gonna like get first shift calendar time to event time, right? Fix the event time, aggregate these different like event time normalized ATTs according to how big it is the group, given that you have data for that event. You can implement all this nowadays in Stata CSDID, is the name of the command. You can implement this in R, the package is DID. You're about to be able to implement this in Python, the package is called differences, right? For the first time, an AV of Python, because the Python package is better than the R package. The R package is, is, is very fast. People say R package is low. It is like we have a lot of data on time periods, right? And you want to do bootstrap inference and construct uniform confidence intervals. If you do not care about that, our package is fast. And I have to defend my ground. Estimation and inference is standard, nothing is new. That's what I mean. Oh, and by the way, this is one thing. Do not trust our output blindly as well, right? So our output, if you do ATTGT in R, we always gonna output things for you. This is a situation that we, we output something for you. But I mean, some of these groups here are so tiny, has a single printed state. There is no way I can trust this confidence interviews. It's a computer program, right? What us the users, we should look at our design. So I don't trust this, but I'm using this as building blocks for something more aggregated. And this is something that is more aggregated over here. So this I can do, this I can trust. We're going to bring all the data together. The other one, I'm just stepping stones to get here. It's just like a warning that because we are outputting things for you, do not take it face value, right? Analyze the output carefully. And in this application, things are very similar. Right? So wrapping it up, right? Take away message, be careful, work on first principles, choose your weights, they are policy relevant for your application. A lot of things has blown up in the negative messages of this. This is because we have to shock first so people can, can listen. In practice, 
Difference is going to happen a lot if you have a lot of dynamics and if you do not have a never treated group. If you have a never treated group and you're willing to assume that this group is a valid quantum factor for the others, these problems get so substantially downwards, right? But in some situations, you don't have that. That's if you do not have a never treated, or if you do not want to use the never treated group, that's when these new methods tend to give different answers. I'll stop here. I'm over time as usual, but good. Yes. So can you talk a little bit? I don't know which foot then you would put this in, but all the functional form considerations of parallel trends and whether it holds in log outcome oh, or I love this level outcome or and like what conditions do you have to have in place in order for an ATT to be like robust to some kind of transformation of your outcome? I love the question because our paper just got accepted to econometrica like yesterday. All this. right. <laughs> yeah. So and I mean so John and I have this paper like when parallel trends it is sensitive to functional form, right? And we, in that paper we're trying to answer exactly the question. So in other part, I mean, so here, parallel trends, it's an expectation. So if I measure the outcome in levels, or if I measure them in logs, I'm changing my assumption. The question is, well, how do I know the right transformation for my parallel trends to hold? Can I actually learn that transformation from the data? The first answer is like, you cannot learn from that from the data to pinpoint. You can exclude some, but you cannot pinpoint. When this is going to be sensitive to functional form restrictions? So to answer that question, we have to flip. When this is robust against all types of functional forms you want. So what we do, like we first zoom into monotone class of functions, right? So I mean, at least like I'm taking monotone transformations. And in order for this to be completely robust against all monotone transformations, we have to have parallel trends in CDFs. Right? So we have to have parallel trends in distribution. And the idea is like, well, you sure like, if you like statistics like I do, probability theory like I do, think about this as moment generating functions. It has to hold for the moment generating function, right? but this is slightly different. But, but I mean, that's the same intuition. So if I had like V here for all transformations, I have to have part of the trend in CDS. Then you ask me, how am I ever going to get part of the trend in CDS? We characterize that three cases you can have. Either you're going to have like quasi random treatment, right? So it's kind of like an experiment. You can get that. Yeah, we know that, no big deal. You can have no trends. So treatment is stationary narrative. You can have that as well. Again, nothing new. But we have a third case. You can split, if you can split the population into two groups, some part of the population behaves as if they are random assigned, some other part of the population behaves as if there is no trends. Right? I do not know, I do not need to know which partition you belong to. As long as I can construct that partition, I have parallel trend CDS. Right? Is that realistic? Don't know. Is that testable? Very much. Because parallel trend CDFs, I'm going to have one distribution plus another minus another. Distributions have to be monotonically increasing and non negative. I can test that. So we also put like in the, in the, we propose a test to kind of like this is the moment inequality test to check if this is monotonically increasing. So we have trying we're closing the package right now to implement that. But yes, but it, and it, it's funny because parallel trends can hold in levels and in logs. We have examples that it holds in levels and logs, right? So it's feasible. It's possible. It's just hard, but it's possible. So I have a question for like our, our doctoral students who may want to implement this here. When you see SVID commands, so sometimes when you go into commands, they have a tremendous number of options and things you have to read through. If you were, you know, instructing um, graduate students, what would you tell them are the really important options they need to pay attention to and focus on in terms of choices? So the first thing, like the main important choice, it is the choice of control group. So are you going to use the never treated or the not yet treated? So that's the choice number one you have to pick. And if you ask me how, which one do I pick? 
that's a hard choice for me to make a statement right? because that's very application specific. Yes. So you have to think about, I'm willing to assume that the lemma treated units are good counterfactor units for my eventually treated. If yes, you keep them. If not, you drop them from the data or you subset from the data. That's the first choice. Second choice it is, do I believe that parallel trends holds only after I control for covariates, right? So do I believe in conditional parallel trends or I believe in unconditional parallel trends? If I believe in conditional parallel trends, we have three different options over there which is like a inverse probability weighting estimator, a regression-based estimator, or an imputation-based estimator, and a double robust procedure. I like the double robust procedure better because it gives you two shots to hit your target. So uh, double robust is gonna implement the IPW, the regression, when you combine the two, as long as one of the two are correct, it's gonna be good to go. What is the catch there? If you, if you do not have overlap, right, double robust, in IPW going to be awful, right? Because these methods do not want to extrapolate. Regression wants to extrapolate. And that you have to worry about. And that's, just, that's the two main options that I have. I mean, you may also say, well, Carlo and Santana have a strange choice of pre-treatment choices. I'm going to show you what I mean by that. So in this plot, right, minus one is not normalized to zero. Right? This is the number one question we get by mail. I, get, I mean, we used to get this question at least twice by week, at least to the point that like we wrote a blog post explaining why this is not normalized. And now we do have an option to normalize or not normalize. We call it like universal. If you wanna stick this to normalized, that's like universal baseline comparison, right? Or if you have time variable, what is the catch? The catch is that under the null hypothesis that I have parallel trends everywhere, it doesn't matter. I can normalize here, 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 or there, right? And this not normalized version, it's good to capture anticipation between them, mm -hmm. right? So if I have anticipation, this, this minus one or minus two, I'm gonna jump earlier and I'm gonna be able to capture that very easily. If I normalize it, it's good to capture global violations of parallel trends, but it's very bad to capture Anticipation. So when we're writing this, we're thinking more about anticipation mm -hmm. than the other one. So we made this choice, but nobody does that. So now we like have both options. Yes. Okay, I know we're out of time, but we have one more question from the chat. Um, could you explain again about the specific context dealing with staggered treatment timing in which this approach to DID would be necessary? So it is necessary. I mean, necessary is a strong word, right? I will, I'll say like, when is that desirable? So in general, it's gonna be desirable if I have variation treatment timing, right? So I do not have only two groups. If I have variation treatment timing, this is essentially desirable, right? If I have only two groups, like treated and untreated, you can still use it, but this negative weight in problems goes away, right? That's the first thing. Second, when you wanna see bigger difference in your results, if you have treatment effect dynamics, right? If treatment grows over time, it's not like a jump and stay on, these methods are gonna give you different answers, right? If you have heterogeneous treatment dynamics, treatment effect dynamics, so each cohort have different dynamics, there is more room for this, like deviations. If you, ha if you have a big enough never treated group, right, negative weights get smaller. I think there's a like there's a new paper by Nico Colazar, Peter Hall, and Paul Goldsmith Pinkham that they, they can they have an appendix result trying to characterize this contamination bias. And they have like, well, if the proportion of never treated units it is bigger than the other cohorts, negative weights do not appear in their simplified example of three periods. But that shed light like perhaps. You may not have these issues if I have a large enough never to be That's essentially the case is it's going to matter more. And did you say also if you don't have a never treated group? Yes. And you don't drop that last treated oh. group, then it gets worse. There is a lot of data massage you can do. So you can do a poor man's correction by just dropping those yes. later periods. So this you should drop 
from 2004 onwards, the yeah. bias got shrunk by a lot. Yeah. Right. Also, if you have if you have always treated units and you drop them, the problem gets like better. The, all these issues is essentially I give a data set. You don't do any data cleaning. You just go and dump trade things that right on top of it. That's like recipe for problems. You don't want to do that, right? So if you're careful on the way you're going to construct, oh, I'm going to drop these periods. Everybody, it is already treat, eventually treated. I'm going to drop like always to the units. Then I'm going to be, I mean, I can be stacking, right? I can, I'm going to be careful on the compressor that I do. I want to avoid compositional changes. Can I do that? All these want to mitigate all of the problems. What is my concern? There are too many steps, right? To do these things, it's very easy to make a small mistake, right? So unless someone like have a very clear guideline and know exactly what they are doing, it, I'm more hesitant. But those issues usually solve it all, right? If you do it properly, it solve it all. And then of these various methods, how many of them extend into nonlinear systems, or are they mostly none? My my takers will be none. Right, so I mean, if you because all this is depend on parallel trends, mm -hmm. and parallel trend is very cultural problem specific, right? Mm -hmm. If you have parallel, let me go here. If you have parallel trends in an index form, right? Jeff Woodridge has a paper who does this, like nonlinear difference in differences, right? So I mean, I want to do like parallel trends, like I want to do this logistic. All this is essentially using OLS, right? If you have the trick is this, nonlinear models are complicated because if you want to have unit fixed effects, you have to give up because of incidental parameter problems. But you don't I mean the thing is like you don't need unit fixed effects. All you need is group fixed effects. And group fixed effects are not really fixed effects are dummies. Right? Because as long as the group is large enough, those problems get washed out. So it's currently, as far as I am aware, none of these methods. Tackle the case of the staggered adoption, the, the like nonlinear models. Woodridge has a working paper doing this. Most likely, his paper is already accepted at the Econometrics Journal. I'm not 100 percent sure, but it was invited. Yeah. So we did, we have another version which is not which is a multiplicative parallel trend. Yes, where the the it's common dynamics, not additive. Yes, where, where you can actually. Build that in, but it's for, it's a special case. Yeah, for non-negative variables, right? I think like parallel trends, not parallel, I mean, kind of like parallel ratios. Mm -hmm. Right, so you have like you know, ratios in ratios instead of difference in differences. That is more plausible, right? Because if you do this, you can get a negative imputed value for something that that is impossible. So if limited dependent variables, this is something is very testable, right? Because I mean, I. It's possible that I get negative values because the imputation for the uncle, the unprinted outcome, it's linear. It, I'm gonna add two averages and subtract another one that's not restricted to the nature. So you can test those things. I haven't seen people doing that. I don't know why. I know why economists never they believe that linear models are good for everything. <laughs> All right, I'm going to be cognizant of your time. I know we're over, but thank you so much. This is really excellent. Thank you, everybody.